people think undernutrition and overnutrition or overweight are two different ends of a spectrum. Um, yes, they may be, but let's put some facts to those, uh, or, or figures to those uh, ideas. India has the highest rates, not numbers, which is also the case, but the highest rates of malnutrition, undernutrition in the world. It is also, New Delhi is also the diabetes capital of the world. Mauritania, 40% of the moms are overweight. 30% of the uh, kids are underweight. I think both undernutrition and overweight are happening in the same countries, oftentimes the same households at the same time. So if we think we can work in silos and somehow divide these communities and groups and have different strategies for different things, um, I, I think we may be living uh, in a fool's paradise. The point that I would really like to mention is that all this happens, so all these dynamic changes happen in the, within the family, within the household. And that is the, sort of the, the unit of analysis that I would like to propose to this forum, that we can focus on the household as the place where things happen in terms both of uh, acquiring the food that eventually gets laid on the table and in terms of the food that eventually from the table gets into the individual's mouth and organism, as we have discussed uh, dealing with the bioavailability issues on other sessions. We are in the midst of the double burden of disease. You find undernutrition side by side with problems of diet and chronic diseases. I think we'd all agree about that. When I do lay presentations on, on topics like overweight and obesity, uh, particularly with policymakers, because they'll, they'll uh, sometimes get very hostile and say, well, why don't you have the answer? A lot of work's going on. What's the answer? And I tend to use the analogy that the overweight and obesity problem globally is like a large puzzle that has a thousand pieces. Some of the pieces are bigger than others. But in order to fill out the complete puzzle, you need all the pieces in place, some smaller, some larger. Perhaps now we understand there's a need for a food governance with health as a driver. We need to correct the dynamics through intersectoral comprehensive nutrition policy with a life cycle approach and considering not only food security, but food and nutrition security. Now, we've been saying this for a number of years, but unfortunately this is not happening. So what is needed? We need, first of all, to look beyond the health sector. A lot of these things are, are ha happening outside the health sector. We can advise, but we're not in charge. So we need to involve agriculture, trade, education, environment. And policies must address, in some way, the behavior of the major companies, creating incentives to improve healthy market functioning. Policies must focus on the promotion of healthy diets uh, over the long term among groups of low socioeconomic status. That should be really the main target beneficiary. Both of these are problems of poverty. They are not problems on the one hand of sloth and gluttony, on the other hand of poverty. And that's a very important thing to realize when we think about the public health challenges we face on both sides of the coin. What we need to be looking at when we deal with the overnutrition side is to find solutions that will deal with one without hurting the poor who are still facing hunger and malnutrition. What we are need to be doing on the undernutrition side is to being sensitive on what's, when we need targeting in a country that has a predominantly overweight problem and when the global problem is undernutrition, we ignore the overweight problem. So that prevention agenda, which doesn't necessarily play very well with companies or with governments, nevertheless, is an incredibly powerful agenda if you can get the right agents in the right place at the right time to make the right moves. Changing behavior in relation to obesity in particular, which has a strong health prevention association, um, that actually, it seems to me, is something that is timely for that reason alone, in terms of the prevention of disease. Under two years old, that's a window opportunity. That's important, I agree. And we will do an experiment uh, in large for Professor Chen Chun Ming's, uh, she did, uh, in the large scale. But still, I think 
we need to think about those uh, students uh, who are under 15. Uh, how much of them in China is under nutrition? Think about this. It's uh, 20 million to 30 million of them under nutrition. We could not ignore them, and we could not say this is totally inefficient. I am from GE Healthcare, and we have, uh, we really are a broad-based diagnostics, health information technology, and life sciences company that's dedicated to early health, finding disease earlier, being able to prevent it, and treating it more effectively. Why can't the same approach be applied to malnutrition? where scientific methods and tools can be used to allow for risk stratification and identification of those that are at risk for malnutrition, bone disease, and in particular obesity with associated type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and metabolic syndrome. I see a reason to link malnutrition with efforts to address obesity within a common cause. There is an opportunity for public-private partnerships to identify and quantify people with metabolic risk, with risk of micronutrient deficiency, monitor interventions, and allow for education, prevention, and innovative nutritional solutions. One lesson is that general subsidies just do not work. Mexico was spending in food uh, programs more than a billion dollars a year focusing at uh, distributing milk, in urban areas, in school programs, that probably had only as a consequence getting children fatter. Another lesson here is that soft drinks, sweetened drinks, juices, are now 22% of the caloric intake of the Mexican uh, population. And that is only increasing. Now, the interesting news is that soft drinks are very vulnerable to um, economic and fiscal uh, incentives. So uh, a 10% increase in taxes for soft drinks has a consequence of reducing 50% the intake. So there's something that might be done toward fiscal incentives in that sense. <laughs>